Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest today, Peter Bick from Arizona State University, the writer, producer, director of Carbon Nation. This is part two in our series uh, about the documentaries that he has produced. Peter, again, thanks for joining me. Pleasure. It's great having you on the show. <laughs> All right, in our, we covered uh, solar, wind, uh, some of the solutions that, that you were able to uncover in Carbon Nation. Uh, I want to talk about the Department of Defense sure. because uh, we've had a number of uh, members of the Department of Defense on the show from generals down to some of the, uh, in fact, deputy assistants in charge of sustainability and those issues. We've been very impressed with how forward-thinking uh, DOD has been. Uh, but first of all, our sense is that 99% of the American public has no clue as to what the department's thinking is and what it's based on. Tell me a little bit about your experience. Now I agree, and that's why the folks who are in Carbon Nation were happy we were making it, because they wanted more people to know that they're thinking about this stuff. I mean, the Department of Defense is thinking about energy for a number of reasons. One, they know how much money and blood they're, they're providing to have the oil lanes open in the Middle East. They know. So when any soldier that I've met comes back from Iraq or Afghanistan, they're getting into clean energy because they know they were fighting a resource war. They know they were protecting oil lanes. And now they're coming back. They don't want other people to have to go through that. They know the price. And um, I've had many of my students, actually, at ASU. They're veterans, and they want to make movies about how clean energy is the way to go because they know the price that's being paid for fossil fuels. Well, I mean, and I think you explore some of this, certainly the price in terms of the amount of money, the, yeah. the billions of dollars that the Department of Def Defense spends on energy, yeah. on energy production, on transporting energy, uh, the vulnerability it creates for its troops who have to go through you know, dangerous areas with tanker trucks of oil or gasoline or diesel, whatever yep. the case may be. Yep. Um, also, I don't think the, the film touches too much on the concept of energy independence, but right. what you're talking about, the fact that we go to war often because of our dependence on the, and, and yet we could be independent of those obligations if we wanted. Right, so it's a question of budget, really. That's how I looked at it when we started the film was, you know, our budget for defense is about $700 billion a year. How much of that's being spent on green energy? So I wanted to go down that road, and the folks who I was making my movie with weren't so excited that I wanted to go down that road. They thought that was a little too lefty, right? Not as big tent, right? And so then I met the former CIA director, Jim Woolsey. Jim's been a guest on the show. And I met him just right down the street here, actually. And he then, when I'm interviewing him, says, hey, we just put out a paper. This was February of 2008 when I interviewed him. It's called More Fight, Less Fuel. We've just done this defense science board. They've hired us to volunteer to write this paper about how the DOD is using its energy. Who's in charge of the DOD's energy? The biggest user of energy on Earth. Nobody's in charge. Nobody knows the energy bills. Nobody's even keeping track of them. So when you're not keeping track of them, you don't know how to save money from them, right? And so when, and, and, and you just take that all the way down the road. So they realized that they were wasting a lot of energy they didn't need to putting soldiers in harm's way by wasting energy out in the field, but then the whole point of how much energy they're using to protect the energy lanes to get energy back to us, and then they're thinking it through, if the sea levels rise, if there's civil unrest, who are they going to call? Who's the world going to call to make this civil unrest a little less civil, a little more civil? Us. So they don't want to fight those wars. Right. So they're thinking all the way through, and then they're going to their bases and realizing how insecure their bases are. And one of, our, one of the generals in our film, uh, General Dana Petard, he was in charge of Fort Irwin. Fort Irwin was where every single U.S. Army soldier was trained for Iraq. Everyone. He gets on base. He's the base commander. He's there a couple of weeks. And Southern California Edison calls and says, oh, by the way, we've got to work on the line to your base. So you're going to be without electricity for 18 hours the line. And we filmed the whole line. It's one line from the energy producing in Mojave to Fort Irwin about, I don't know, 20 or 30 miles away. One line. Yeah. That's it. So he immediately... A slight, bit, a slight bit of exposure. Exactly. One electric line. So he then starts thinking we need to have solar power, right? And then they start doing a deal with Southern California Edison. Let's build a big solar array. We could use all the solar we need, sell the rest to Vegas. 
so we can have more Cirque du Soleil. From the increasing risk of extreme weather events to sea level rise. As deltas get flooded worldwide, and there are a lot of very highly populated deltas, you can think Mississippi, you can think Ganges, you can think Nile. Uh, those people are going to have to move. The world is not ready to accept all those refugees, so there are going to be a lot of wars or nearly wars. And should they occur in some parts of the world where the United States has very significant presence and interest, you'll have a security problem that affects the United States. But there are closer in, more, more critical elements that affect security. Fundamentally, we all understand we've got to get off our dependency on foreign oil. The nations in the Middle East are more important now because of our desire for oil. If you take that out of the equation, then maybe the kind of spectrum of conflict we see ourselves in over there may change. President uh, George H.W. Bush would probably not have felt he had to protect Saudi Arabia from Iraq if the Persian Gulf had been home of two-thirds of the world's proven supply of broccoli. If you've been at a public university or a federal lab, I've paid for your education. I want your opinion. But there's this thing with scientists where they feel like they can't tell you their opinion. It will demean their, their position. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Because I've never done endorsements or commercials, people ask how are our programs funded, especially because we provide them as a public service to all our broadcast outlets. It's expensive to produce our show, whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., or even Iraq. The answer is we depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's top opinion leaders. Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax-deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to help allow us to continue to work for you. To find out more to make a donation, just go to dmefd.org. The DMEF is a tax-exempt public charitable organization and has promised to dedicate 100% of every contribution to support our public affairs initiatives. If you believe, as I do, in the need for a forum which promotes civil discourse and mutually respectful discussion, I hope you'll decide to make a contribution today. All right, welcome back. We've been talking about the Department of Defense. Do you think that the department is being listened to on Capitol Hill, especially, I mean, you have a Republican House, a Republican Senate. I've certainly seen hearings where they're not being listened to. Um, the, I think the place where the common ground is gonna happen is actually ground. Um, I think that when you talk about soil and soil regeneration, that's where both sides are going to be heard. And actually, the Army has a lot of land, and they have a lot of buffer zones, and they're literally working on ways to regenerate that land. But uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of uh, national security, mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of you know, how much, you know, the, the fact that we have over 800 military bases around the world, uh, that we are spending, uh, and actually, if you include the you know, Department of Veterans Affairs, the Veterans Administration, if you include the nuclear budget within the Department of Energy and, and all of that. I mean, we, we're spending, closing on a trillion dollars a year on defense. Yeah. Uh, and as you mentioned, the fact that we invest so much in, and certainly when you look at the Middle East and, and what's going on there, uh, why doesn't Congress take a look at the, this whole concept of uh, energy security, energy independence, and and then have, you have Department of Defense officials saying, hey, we, we need to address climate change. Uh, the department has assessed in great detail the impacts of climate change on nations around the world, on every nation around the world. Mm -hmm. Yet, I don't, I don't see much response. I also don't hear much about DOD making this case. Is the department making this case? Is, and if it is, it's certainly not making it very effectively. Well. That'd be a great documentary. Congress and the rest of the country are two different things. And so I look at the American 
population, 340 million, 320 million, is mostly in agreement on this stuff. Congress isn't. Uh, you can get into why, and it's probably about follow money. Um, but when you talk, you, you had a lot of different issues there. When you talk about 800 bases, I'm not sure of that number, but I'm going to trust you on that. 834. That, 834. That's based on World War II more than anything else, right? And then when you look at the Defense Department and the way procurement is, they've tried to get something in every single congressional district. Right. Right. So those are, those are, that's, you're talking jobs, right? You, so all of a sudden if you're saying, okay, I believe climate change is real and it's a threat, therefore I have to fire people, that's a, that's a pr troubling equation, right? But what, what a lot of people are saying is you can say climate change is real, it's happening, and you can hire a lot of people. And that's where the flip is, needs to happen. And so is the Department of Defense making that case that there's actually more jobs when you have a clean energy economy than there are jobs in the economy that we have right now? I don't know if they're making that case. Um, I know that uh, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Ray Mabus, was in the Senate talking about how he wanted to go to you know, uh, biofuel 2.0 and he was told, you're not the Secretary of Energy, you're the Secretary of the Navy. And he got slammed. So, um, yeah, there's, there's definite conflict there. Um, how well they're making their case, I don't know. I don't, I don't know all the conversations. But I think it's a very strong case to make. It, I bet you we could save a lot of money if we went towards a clean energy future than not. You know, I've had a number of military leaders on the show. General John Allen's been on the show. General David Petraeus has been on the show. General Colin Powell, uh, a number of others. Uh, General Wesley Clark. Uh, most of the, the members of the military that I've had on the program are have retired right. from, from office. And I, I'm wondering if but those... Where are they on climate change? Um, well, I think some of them are fairly progressive, but I, I'm, I'm wondering if those who are currently active in mm -hmm. the military are, are hesitant uh, to be as outspoken as they need to be. What's your experience? I mean, the people I've interviewed, it might be self-selecting by the fact that they said yes to us interviewing them. Right. We're very much aware that climate change is real, happening, human caused, and we've got to get to solutions. Right, like, but no I, didn't see, I didn't see the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on. I didn't see the Secretary of the Army, Navy. Right, but you saw a general. Right. Um, and to start. I know that at West Point right now, that folks who actually went to ASU are now teaching sustainability to the cadets. So it's being taught at the, you get into the Army, you're taught this, certainly you, as an officer. Do you think the media uh, is involved in any self-censorship when it comes to addressing climate change? Is the media holding back uh, on addressing climate change in a really robust manner for the American people? On the whole, you'd have to say yes, because they're not talking about it very much. Why not? I don't know. What's your guess? I'm talking about it all the time. What's your guess? Um, and I'm into conspiracy theories, no, so I, fire I, away. I'm, I'm not, actually. Um, I think it's, I think it's they've, they've told themselves that the ratings are low, and so they're not going to sell as much soap. I think it's as simple as that. In Arizona, when you look at climate change... But it, I will say, I think if they went down the road that we're going down, which is talking about solutions, their ratings wouldn't be low. But then they say they can only sell murder and mayhem and they can't sell good stories. So maybe I don't understand the human character as much as I need to to be successful in the news business. I don't know. If it bleeds, it leads. That's, that's, that's certainly a well-used phrase, and I'm sure, I'm sure it was well-earned. Well, what about, I mean, uh, we'll talk about Arizona. I mean, when you look at climate change impacts on Arizona, mm -hmm. they're severe. When you you're mean with the drought in the Southwest, oh yeah, uh, you know wildfires, drought, yeah. pine beetles, whatever the case may be. Pine beetles here in, Ca in oh, Colorado, yeah, in Colorado, well. millions and millions of acres. And you address that. Yeah. you address that in the. In, in fact, we you know we may we may see a clip on that. Right. Uh, but does the in your experience in Arizona, mm -hmm. are you seeing the media cover these topics in a manner that really informs the public or not? Well, you're you're kind of giving me a, a softball with that question because our school the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism runs the PBS station there. And we are basically going to just make that a huge issue just by doing it for the whole region. We're, we're writing a grant right now for the whole Southwest region from Denver to LA to be the team that talks about climate, climate solutions, climate issues. 
And so, so we feel there's a huge gap. And from our Dean Callahan on down, he wants to address it. So he's kind of glad I'm there for that. But there's a lot of other people that want to talk about it as well. When you think about the uh, appearance of those uh, concerned about climate change and who can inform the public about climate change, mm -hmm. do you see the cable news stations, the national stations, or even local stations interviewing climate scientists or interviewing people such as yourself with expertise in the field? Well, um, I've been on the Weather Channel a couple times, <laughs> so I love that. Um, I don't watch the news. So I'm, I'm not the guy to ask that question. I see statistics where they say, you know, this climate change was mentioned twice in the 2012 campaign, you know, things like that, right, you know. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't actually watch the news. I, I, I listen to radio and I'll read, and I read mostly online now. Um, I'll read the, what I used to buy with the paper. You know, I, I, I subscribe to newspapers so I can get there online so they still have me um, happily. But I don't watch TV news, and I haven't watched it since I was a little kid, because of do, how, I mean, it was horrible. Do you, Look, think, do you, you know, think that climate scientists are not invited uh, here, on these programs? Here's a trick. I was invited to speak to climate scientists about how to communicate climate change last summer um, in Boulder. And I'm talking about talk solutions. Give people something to hook their hopes on, something to do, and they won't be so depressed that they don't want to watch it, right? But these scientists, these experts, are experts on the problem. And they feel very uh, unequipped, ill-equipped, to speak about solutions they're not experts on. And so there's a kind of, you can understand that logic, right? Uh, I'm not an expert in that, so I won't talk about that. But I am an expert in that we're in a severe drought and it's going to get worse. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Fine. What are your opinions? What do you think? Oh, I can't tell people what I think. Why not? Because that's not what scientists should do. They should be objective. What are you talking about? You're the one who's the expert. I want your opinion. If you've been at a public university or a federal lab, I've paid for your education. I want your opinion. But there's this thing with scientists where they feel like they can't tell you their opinion. It will demean their, their position. And I, I truly don't understand that. Uh, there's another phenomenon, I think, also, uh, and uh, I'm a big fan of climate scientists. Let, mm -hmm. me, let me start off. But uh, I think there's also been historically a lot of arrogance where a mm -hmm. number of cli climate scientists will say, well, this is settled science. I'm not going to discuss it. I'm not going to debate someone who disagrees with what I consider settled, settled science. Uh, and what that does is creates a void where those who disagree or have a different opinion or, or, or don't think uh, you know, mankind's involvement in climate change is significant, they fill that void, they mm -hmm. fill that vacuum. Uh, so I think there's, there's been an, an arrogance, which uh, I think has been a real problem. Well, also arrogance is never good, right? And if you're not listening to people who disagree with you, that's not going to help you have a dialogue. Or, or you're, a lot of them have been, until recently, I think this is changing because they see they've, they're, they've been losing serious ground in, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, public opinion in some sectors, uh, but they would not engage, they would not debate. Uh, oh, I'm not going to debate someone who's not also a climate scientist. And so you're, you're seeing that across the board? You're seeing that more than once or twice, that oh, kind abso of absolutely. non -engagement? And, and I'm talking about you know, people at the top of uh, mm -hmm. the food chain in terms of climate scientists and some, right. of, the, some of the best known people. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and I've talked to them directly and, and said similar things to them. And I said, hey, I think you have an obligation to do this. I think that's changing and now they're being, I think people are being encouraged mm -hmm. to, to, to uh, get involved in that kind of engagement. I, I still don't think it's happening very much. Though. Yeah, I, I, I think that if you don't debate what you believe in, you can prove, you are going to leave a vacuum. I, I understand that. I, I haven't talked to enough. Most scientists I talk to are like, bring it on. Um, but a lot of scientists that I work with readily admit they're not the best communicators. Right. They're not. That's a, a big and factor. So that, a lot of them, I think, might be yeah. more what's behind that. Right. Than well, they say, I, I'm a scientist. I do research. I yeah. write. Uh, I'm not a public speaker. I'm not comfortable in public settings, and I understand so that. So that might be more to the right. point. But um, a lot of them are. I mean, I know a lot of them that are very engaging, very good in a public they setting. They should be out there. They should be, but they're not. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with Peter in just a moment. If we trust our planet's five billion years of research and development, 
and work in concert with nature, the land could revert to what it does best, taking airborne carbon and storing it, sequestering it back in our forests, farms, and pastures. First, we've got to stop burning down the trees. A couple solutions. In the Amazon, a major cause of deforestation is to clear grazing land for beef cattle and farmland to grow soy to feed the cattle. If the meat eaters like myself go meatless just one day a week, it would reduce not only huge amounts of CO2, but also the powerful greenhouse gas methane, a byproduct of cow burps. Second, ecotourism. When people who live in or next to rainforests make more money protecting them, the rainforests stay. So you do have you know, refrigerators from 1975 used four times the amount of energy for refrigerators right now. But do people have a second refrig in the, in the, in the, in the garage? So there's that issue, right? Um, but the TVs we're using right now use more energy than those fridges. And so are we using less energy? Pushing against it is, is folks who don't want to change. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. It's tough for me to limit myself to 140 characters, but you can see how well I do by following the show on Twitter. Follow me at at sign Aaron Harbour. In addition to forests, farms hold vast potential for grabbing CO2 out of the air and storing it in their soil. But alas, most conventional farmers have yet to jump on the sequestering bandwagon. Generally, a conventional farm is set up more like a factory. The soil is the factory. Farmers buy inputs, whether they're seeds, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and they bring those into the factory, the soil, and they have product going out the other end. The problem with that system is it's based on a, an industrial model. And we all know that every factory and every industry wears out. But when the soil wears out, we're in trouble. But in organic farming systems, we're improving the soil and the health of the soil while we're using it. One of the pieces that we're beginning to understand about what happens in the life of the soil is mycorrhizal fungi. It is a fungi that will attach itself to the root hair, and it creates a symbiotic relationship with the plant. The mycorrhizal fungus is the main mechanism by which carbon accumulates in the soil, not for a season, not for tens of seasons, not for hundreds of seasons, but up to thousands of years. These mycorrhizal fungi flourish in organic systems. They're not as prevalent in conventional systems. So chemicals inhibit their growth, or sometimes, like fumigants, will kill them. Another thing that kills the fungi is leaving fields fallow. What we happen to know here in our research is, is one of the best things you can do is put in a winter cover crop. What's really important about this is it leaves a place for this mycorrhizal fungi to stay alive and grow. And when we do that, we can literally sequester over 1,000 pounds of carbon per acre per year. But the other really important piece to this is cover cropping greatly reduces the capacity for that soil to erode because you have crop and root there to hold it in wind or rain. There's a lot of carbon in soil. Preventing it from eroding not only keeps enormous amounts of carbon from being released, the resulting carbon-rich soil would retain water in drought, absorb water in flood, and produce healthier food. Welcome back to the show. This is uh, our last segment in our multi-program, our three-program series with Peter Beck. I mean, one of the really interesting aspects of carbonation, which I think remains very relevant, is, is the segment you had on uh, how old refrigerators were being traded in for new refrigerators. And just the concept that by doing things that are more energy efficient, we can save a, a tremendous amount of, of, of energy and of costs, uh, et cetera. Talk a little bit about that. Also, I want you to answer the question, I don't see a robust conversation about energy conservation, which to me seems to be the low-hanging fruit. Why aren't we doing way more on that front? It's, it's interesting about energy conservation. Um, 
I think I've evolved a little bit since I've made the film. Um, so, so you do have, you know, refrigerators from 1975 used four times the amount of energy for refrigerators right now. But do people have a second refridge in the, in the, in the, in the garage? So there's that issue, right? Um, but the TVs we're using right now use more energy than those fridges. And so are we using less energy? Personally, I just wish I had solar panels on my roof so I don't have to worry about it. You know, so I have my fridge and I have my TV and I can just power it with the sun. So, so if, we, if we go solar, who cares how efficient they are? I mean, and in if you a have way. A, and if you have battery backup, right. you, you're independent. Yeah. You're autonomous. I mean, it's nice to be as efficient as you can. Why not, right? Um, especially if the power goes out or if you're on battery power, you want to be using as little as possible. Um, but I don't think people are necessarily using less power with more efficient gear. I think they're just having more gear. How many things do you have plugged in right now that you didn't have plugged in oh, 10 years ago? I've, all my outlets are overloaded. Right, so. go to a hotel room. The smart ones now have seven plugs on the desk. You don't have to pull the table out between the beds or you know, try to rewire the TV. So, so, but that said, energy efficient homes, you know, like it, it, it makes sense for a lot of reasons. You could just have a cozier place without using as much energy. And if you're not on solar power, then energy efficiency is going to be pretty key. And I think that conversation is going on pretty strongly, actually. What's really interesting is the people who are most against climate change who came to my movies were the ones who had the most energy efficient homes. They had the most advanced things like, con like the concrete insulated forms and things like that. They had that stuff. Because it's dollar driven. It's dollar driven. So, and that's fine. Right. Who, you know? who cares? How the, who cares what their opinions are as long as they're moving in the right direction? Exactly, even if you're a greedy bastard, right? That's what one of the guys in the movie says. It's like, That's fine, right? Great. I don't care if you care about climate change. If you're saving energy, have at it. I'm right there with you. All right. And I think that's where the common ground actually is. Okay, on that note, we're going to end part two of our three-part series with Peter Bick. Peter, thanks so much for joining me. Pleasure. All right, one more show to go. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. These are beautiful. So bright. Kind of feels like we're on a prairie here with the grasses behind me. A lot of Illinois species. But we're actually 12 stories above street level. We're on the roof of City Hall. And this was our first experience with a green roof. The temperature on a green roof is about 80 or 90 degrees in the summer whereas the temperature on a black roof can be up to 160, 170 degrees. I can feel the heat emanating from this other black roof over here. So bringing that temperature down on the roof surface makes it easier to air condition inside, but it also keeps the ambient environment around the building cooler, which re reduces air conditioning costs for your neighbors. We calculated that if we can reduce the temperature in the city by one degree, we can save $150 million a year on air conditioning costs. As effective as green roofs are, there's something even more valuable, and cheaper, too. I'd like to see what color the roof is. It should be white in this climate. We have a lot of coal being burned in power plants to run air conditioners to take away the heat that wouldn't be in the buildings in the first place if they had light-colored roofs. Besides cooling the earth by reducing coal use, white roofs also help cool the earth by reflecting sunlight making up for the ever-decreasing amount of sea ice that used to reflect sunlight. By the time you got all the roofs white, you would be cooling the earth equivalent to having grabbed 24 billion tons of CO2 out of the air, which is equivalent to capping global warming for the next seven years. It's, it's huge. <laughs>